Do you know the origins of the jewelry you wear? If the answer to that is no, by the end of today, I think you're gonna wanna cleanse it. Once placed in the statue of Sita in India, the Hope Diamond was stolen from its natural home by one thief named Jean Baptiste Tavernier. Within days of the thief fleeing from the site, however, he was ravaged by wolves in Russia and died. Sometime later, the stone made its way to the crown of King Louis XIV, who later died of gangrene. Other famous owners of the stone have followed similarly grisly fates, ranging from losing their head to being publicly killed. I'd be here all day if we went through all 21 plus owners and how they met their end. Heck, even if you just tried on the necklace, you're not safe. A temporary wearer, Princess de Lambelle, was torn to pieces by a French mob. It's currently on display at the Smithsonian, but like, I think maybe that should be scaled back. After being stolen in a similar way to the Hope Diamond, the Delhi Purple Sapphire brought a great deal of bad luck into the lives of anybody who came into contact with it. The English soldier who initially took the gem suffered from a number of crippling medical ailments that altered his way of life forever. After being passed on to a friend of the original thief, the stone was locked in a vault, transferred to the Natural History Museum after a new owner passed away. Put under the care of a museum employee, the stone continued to enact its bad luck, and every time the caretaker traveled with it, he experienced unexplainable misfortune. Cripes, maybe you should just bury it. Not even just keeping it on display seems to stop the misfortunes this jewel brings to the world. This silly little amethyst with an identity crisis. The Black Prince's Ruby is a great name for another cursed gemstone. And similar to the Purple Sapphire, it's not a ruby. It's a 170 carat Cabo Con Spinel, thought to have been mined in the mountains of Afghanistan, well, according to experts. The first mention of it was in the 14th century, when the aptly named Don Pedro the Cruel of Seville, Spain, impaled Abu Said, the Moorish prince of Canada to death and ransacked his corpse, stealing the red stone, according to a jewelry-focused educational blog. Once again, don't steal things, don't kill people, because that's how curses are born. The gemstone was said to bring bad luck and death to anybody who touches it. Historians do argue about the origin of the nickname, but a lot of experts attribute it to the brutal attack on the French town of Limoges in September of 1370, where thousands of folks died, and the Black Prince passed away before he could assume the throne. The stone then fell into the hands of King Henry V, who wore it on his battle helmet when he defeated the French at the Battle of Agincourt. Many British royals have owned it since, including King Henry and his daughter, Queen Elizabeth I. But this gem has been around for quite a number of unfortunate deaths within the royal family. King Charles I held the stone until he lost his head in 1649 for treason, then it was sold off. King Charles II brought it back, but then the battle continued, and it was nearly stolen by Irish Colonel Thomas Blood in 1671 when he attempted to steal the crown jewels from the Tower of London. So the ruby now sits front and center on the Imperial State Crown of England. Look, I believe that inanimate objects can hold negative energy, whether it be a cursed gemstone or a house where something really bad happened. Also, you can't colonize half the world like it's your personal playground for generations, and then expect the good luck gods to smile down on your family. But yeah, we're gonna blame the gem here. The Vine Ring, or the Ring of Sylvanius, is a gold ring dating probably from the 4th century AD, discovered in a plowed field near Silchester in Hampshire, England, back in 1785. Now this ring is larger than most rings, being about an inch in diameter and weighing 12 grams. So the band of it has about 10 facets, and it's set with a square bezel engraved with an image of the goddess Venus. On one side are the letters VE, on the other side, and VS in mirror writing. So the band is inscribed with the words, Seneciane vivas in de. After being unearthed on an archaeological dig, the ring pointed to a deeper and more mysterious history than researchers had originally believed. Roman tablets were found to contain references to the artifact, informing the god that the ring had been stolen. So in the tablet, the former owner of the ring proclaims that whoever has taken the ring shall find themselves in bad health until it is given back to its owner. Well, here's a wild idea. Maybe put that thing back where it came from? The story of this watch starts with the story of two rich guys competing to see who could own the coolest watch. The first man was American businessman Harry Graves, who had made a fortune in banking and the railroads. He was like old money rich, descended from John Graves, who helped to settle Concord, Massachusetts back in 1635. His competitor was automobile tycoon James Ward Packard. Now the two men both frequented Patek Philippe and went back and forth ordering more and more complex watches, according to a recounting of the history by Alan Banbury, the former curator of the Patek Philippe Museum. 
1925, looking for a competitive edge, Graves commissioned a watch with a staggering 24 complications. And this is how the Graves Super Complication was born. Created by Patek Philippe, it is said to be the world's most complicated mechanical watch made, without the use of computer technology. It took seven years to research, develop, and produce the one-of-a-kind timepiece. This thing weighs more than a pound, consisting of 920 individual components, including 430 screws, 110 wheels, 120 mechanical levers and parts, and 70 jewels. Graves paid about 15 grand for the watch at the time, which is over 300,000 in today's money. The watch is a beauty and a technical masterpiece. The celestial chart on it shows the accurate spacing between the stars and their magnitude. And even though it took seven years to make, it took no time at all to wreak havoc. Soon after receiving the watch, Graves' best friend died, followed by the tragic death of Graves' son in a car crash. Graves passed away himself in 1953, and the watch was passed along to family members, seemingly without incident. It was sold at an auction in 1999 to the Sheikh Saud bin Muhammad Al Thani, a member of the Qatari royal family. Now, the Sheikh was a notable frequenter of auction houses, but he didn't really pay his debts. He owed millions of pounds in unpaid invoices, and following a very long legal dispute, his assets were frozen by the High Court in London. In need of some cash, he gave the watch to a well-known auction house to make some money back. Well, two days before the watch was sold for 15 million, he passed away, very suddenly. So is it possible this watch is haunted? Yeah, and I also see the curse of greed. One night, very late at night, Ed and Lorraine Warren were contacted by the Snedeker's family, who had just moved into a house on Meridian Avenue in Southington. Specifically, the mother of the family unit and a niece who came to stay with the family were on the phone. And what they found and bought was like this beautiful big home, but it turns out it was actually a former funeral home. And the morticians there were doing some really bad stuff. We can't talk about it, but it was gnarly. What used to be the showroom for the coffins? Well, that's where the young folks lived. And then they also had like the place where the bodies were prepared for viewing. Lots of ghosties. The boys were the first to be like, something's going on here. They were terrified and the parents were like, mm, you're fine, it, it is what it is. But then the guys were sleeping in the living room because they were like, I can't be around it. Among the sounds they were hearing, they would hear the sounds of chains pulling coffins upstairs. And obviously there's no more coffins in this house. So the women who called the Warrens were terrified. And apparently, while they were on the phone, the covers on the bed were levitating, like there was like a fan blowing them around. Lorraine said, like, while they were on the phone, even more events were happening. The mother had rosary beads in her hand. And while she spoke, those beads were actually being pulled apart and falling to the floor. So Ed and Lorraine went over the next morning with the family's priest. They did a blessing of the house. Didn't really do much, so then they brought in the bishop. The church sent an exorcist, which seemed to do the trick. The family got out of there a short time later, and Ed and Lorraine kept the rosary beads that had been pulled apart. Because if a demonic spirit can touch a Catholic relic, that means it's been infested with something awful, and they didn't want to risk the beads spreading throughout the world and causing more damage. Well, that's all for today, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident ooky spooky girly. See ya!